Hello there, welcome to this week on Discord, the first one of 2023. Hope you had some good rest and relaxation at the end of last month, uh, whether or not you were celebrating any sort of festival. A lot of us here at Redis were celebrating various things, so we were lucky enough to get some time off work, hence the long break. And I'm kind of laughing for two reasons here. One is because whenever we have a break from this show, I can never remember what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, but luckily, didn't forget anything apart from I did forget to share my screen. So uh, <laughs> everyone else is like, yeah, I just need to share my screen, make sure it works. And I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. Totally forgot to do mine. Second thing was just before we came on air, Simon Prickett called us Muppets. So, <laughs> so that's why me and Justin are like laughing already. So uh, yeah, that was kind of him. And um, yeah, so it's been a couple of weeks. We, again, have scoured Discord for all the best and brightest of things that we could find, everything that piqued our interest this week so we could bring you the highlights. But, you know, we really love it if you go and look in Discord as well. Um, so if you want to join us on Discord, it's free to do so. Just go to discord.gg slash redis. We just ask that you read and stick to our code of conduct which we show you when you join the server. So, um, yeah, we've got a few things to bring to you this week, a bit of database stuff, a bit of wacky stuff. So, yeah, let's get on with it. Simon and Justin, come to me. Hello. Hello. Hello, you pair of Muppets. How are you? <laughs> Justin, you're really not find the right buttons again. But <laughs> it reminds me of the... Uh... When I uh, had a, a job interview a lifetime ago, uh, somebody asked me like, "What to what what animal would you be if you had a choice?" I'd be like, "Uh, I don't know, a dolphin." And they're like, "What's the second animal you would choose?" I'm like, "A cuttlefish." And they went on this big spiel about like, "Oh, well, psychologically, this means this and this means that, and you want others to think you're a dolphin, but you really feel like you're a cuttlefish." And I was like, "That'd be a great interview question. Like, what kind of muppet are you?" <laughs> Like like, I thought, I thought you movie. were gonna say, I think you were gonna say that they said, "What animal are you?" And you were so nervous, you're like, "Uh, uh a muppet." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. My favorite one is actually animal. Oh yeah, yeah. I got a little animal up okay. there on my uh, yeah, it's tiny, so far away. Oh, he's but, great. Yeah, that, he always has a positive attitude. <laughs> yeah, I think because you know when people are a little bit oblivious as to what's going on, like of course they're happy. But, um, yeah, animal kind of kills two birds with one stone there because he's an animal and a muppet. Yeah. Mm, totally forgot about that. Simon, how about you? Which animal would you be? Or which muppet? Um, that's a good question. I probably guess bird just because I kind of like bird. Um, and also I've met bird. If you are ever in DC and you go to the Smithsonian, American History on the Mall is free. And it has a rotating collection of quite a lot of Jim Henson stuff. They have a lot of the Muppets. So they usually have a Kermit out and a Miss Piggy and then they kind of rotate some others. So um, you can see they're quite big in, in real life. Are they taller than me? No, because I guess most of them were puppetry, not people. But Yeah, but I'm really oh, they're, they're all real, of course. Sorry. <laughs> oh, right. They're the actual real puppets. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're all real objects and these are just... I wish I'd known that because I've been there and uh, I did not know. I did not know that. Hmm. I did not see them. But let me share my screen. I'm going to do, sorry, everybody who's watching. I'm going to have to do this in a really amateur way and share it now and hope that I don't share the wrong screen because that is always a danger, isn't it? <laughs> um, here we go. This is an animal that has recently been seen in England. It's a fox with two legs. I mean, this fox is really living its best life because as you can see, it's mobile, it can eat. But basically, because it only has two legs on, and those two legs on the front, it's eternally doing handstands and that's how it gets around. So, you know, when you think you've seen everything and then you see this, that is, uh, yeah. And apparently the person who, whose garden this is, feeds the fox spam so that fox is also eating like a king 
It is not eating out of the bin, wow. the trash. It's eating spam. I mean, some people might think spam belongs in the trash. That's a different story. But yeah, this is one's eating proper food out of a proper can. So yeah, that fox is living its best life, isn't it? I can barely stand on my own two legs and I'm supposed to have two legs. That's amazing. Oh, I know. I remember when I was a kid, I used to be able to do handstands and everything. I would not attempt that now. I, no. I, I fear for my health and safety. But yeah, this one, I won't play the video because I don't know what's going to happen. It might send StreamYard into meltdown. But yeah, it, it reminded me of a kangaroo. Oh. The way it was sort of like, yeah, I'll drop the link in the chat actually and um, people can check that out. But yes, so that is a little bit of uh, wacky stuff that is not really related to Redis, but I thought it might tickle some people so let us let us talk about redis now because this is why everybody's here let's see the first thing that we have picked out it is a it's a common thing somebody is uh if they've installed redis using brew on their mac and they're trying to find the config file how many times have you done something similar and you cannot find that file and they have come on discord and they have said to us please help me find this file and Simon, you're going to help, aren't you? Yeah. So let's kind of like back up a little bit. First off, what's Homebrew? It's a package manager for the Mac. There isn't kind of one built in by Apple. So if you're used to using apt or something on other Linux type operating systems, Homebrew is a, a way of replacing that. And you can install stuff and work with it. Um, and one of the things you can install and use is Redis or Redis Stack. And once you've done it, you can do something like this. You can do brew services, start with Redis, and it should go away and start my Redis server. And this thing here seems to be a new in MacOS Ventura that it's like, ooh, that started something in the background, you know, just to be, I guess, aware of you've started something. And then we've got a Redis server here on the standard host and port, so I can just connect to that. And then the question is, um, how do you configure this? So if you want to change some of the default configs, so say you want to turn on, I don't know, key space notifications or something, there's a file called redis.conf and it kind of hides somewhere. So there's a couple of sort of ways you can do this. The sort of operating system way will be uh, find files called redis.conf and this will generate some errors because without being root, I don't have permission to everything, but eventually we'll find some valid answers so we've got one here and we've got one here uh this one in the dot bottle is like the the copy that brew keeps around when it installs things so if you need to reinstall it we'll go back to that one this is the actual one that you want normally use local access to redis.com so that's one way of getting at it and then from there we could just oops, I'm rusty with the keyboard because it's been a couple of weeks. We could basically edit this file and then look for something like notification. Again, can't type notifications. And here's the bit about key space notifications. And then what we need to do would be like this is commented out, so it's not currently configured. We could just remove that, set this value to whatever we want, and write the thing, which I'm not going to do. Um, so you can do that and you can find redis.conf like that with the find command. The other probably easier way, and especially if you're, um, you don't have shell access to Redis and you're going to have to ask somebody else like an administrator to edit the file for you is start at Redis to CLI and do info server. And what you'll see is this gives us a load of information about the Redis server. So Redis 705 and what build it's on, but also down the bottom, it tells us where the binary for Redis server is, so what it's running as, and then here it tells us where the config file is. So you can always find it this way. This is probably the easier way to find it. So the, the, the basic short answer is the info server command is your friend. And um, then you will need to gain access to that file, edit it to make any changes, and bounce the Redis server. And uh, yeah, that was it for that one. So relatively simple, but yeah, it is something that people ask quite regularly. Cool. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, it can be a bit, <laughs> a bit of a panicky moment when you can't find it. And then what you said about when you were typing, you're like, you're a bit out of practice. I would love to know in the chat, who, who who has had some time off recently and then came back to work and couldn't remember their password? 
<laughs> that was a quiet and having laugh from my colleague, Mr. C. Uh, yeah, that happens a lot. Or you just can't remember how to log in full stop. Like, oh, yeah, I've got single sign on. Or where do I have to go for that? Yes. Please, please tell me what it's been like for you going back to work this week. I would love to know. Cool. Okay. Let's have a look at question two. So Justin's going to talk to us. This person wanted to try to export data from a server with a Redis search installed to a server that did not have it installed, but they were running into errors. The search indices seem to exist still. They didn't they weren't sure how to remove them. They were getting themselves in a right old fix. So Justin. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, a really, really good question because it kind of touches up on a lot of things. So they're going from Redis search installed. So that could mean that they have Redis search with the search module installed on top of it, or they're using Redis stack. Um, and they're going to um, just kind of like a vanilla Redis, you know, maybe like 626 or 7, something like that. And so when you have search indices and you're trying to export that, uh, the regular vanilla Redis will probably freak out a little. Like, I have no idea what is going on with this. You know, please help. So what you can do is um, uh, you could you could do it like you could you could write a dump file or have it dump out and like make sure all your index files are removed. But that's not I, I wouldn't recommend that. We actually have like a little software for that. Um, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Um, I've talked about it before. And it's uh, Riot, which is uh, Redis and input output tool. And it's absolutely amazing. I love it. I've used it a lot with like my own personal streams and personal work. And um, it's great. And it basically allows you to um, export data or import data into Redis or out of Redis into other databases. So we have four different tools. Riot DB allows you to export to like a SQL database. Uh, Riot file lets you import or export uh, data from your Redis database into a file, a JSON or XML file. Uh, data generator is actually really cool because you can quickly uh, generate data for your Redis instance using Faker. And I say Faker with two Fs in the beginning, for those of you that know that library. And then Riot Redis does a Redis to Redis migration. So you could do like Elasticash to Redis Enterprise, uh, never the other way around. And uh, you can do uh, Redis search to Redis. So, um, and I can actually show you an example uh, of it going on here. So I have two instances running locally of Redis Cloud. Uh, don't do what I do. I'm calling keys here. You see there's no keys here. I'll call keys here, uh, no keys here. So I'm showing you like there's no, no cards up my sleeve. Um, what I'm gonna do, show you a couple examples of how to use this. Uh, let's do riot gen. And this is just a command line uh, tool, part of, of uh, riot. And this will generate uh, data uh, for my, uh, my Redis instance. By default, it's going to point to your local host. So if I wanted to, um, you know, send it to like a separate host, I could do dash h and then do, you know, my address, what have you, and then um, dash p if I have a separate port. But by default, it's just localhost six three seven nine. So that's really nice. And this is going to create a, a hash where we have first name, last name, a uh, full address, and it will uh, do h that. Um, and you can actually you'll notice that right here, we actually start having like uh, some specifics. So you want to call H set to create these. Uh, you're going to create key space with person and then keys ID. So you're going to have the uh, the actual name of the key person colon and then uh, an ID. Um, but this is not, you know, limited to hashes. You can, you can generate uh, sorted sets. You can, you can generate JSON uh, files, what have you. So let me call this. And it's going to create, I believe, a thousand. Yeah, there we go. That was pretty cool. So let me just check here. Um, don't do this. I'm a professional. I'm calling keys, which blocks and might take a long time. Um, so I have now a thousand different uh, people in this database. And then we call hgetall on 
Uh, it's called person 46. And don't call HK at all unless you know exactly how many key uh, fields you have. It's also a dangerous command because it might block. Um, and here we go. We have Jack Becker that lives in Kriegerboro, South Carolina. Beautiful Kriegerboro. And uh, again, um, there's nothing in my 68, uh, 6380 database. And these are two databases. Uh, I call info modules here. And you can see that I'm running uh, Redis stack. So it has search, a lot of search. It also has you know, uh, JSON, time series, boom filter, and graph. Uh, this one right here is just regular Redis. So nothing going on in there. Um, so what I can do is I can call Riot Redis. And this will go and do a Redis to Redis migration. It's, it's pretty simple. Um, the, I'm setting uh, my target or my uh, my source um, source location is six three seven nine, so it's this one right here, and I'm sending a replication of that database over to six three eight zero, which is this one right here. So just give that a call. It takes a little bit of extra time, and there we go. And now let me check here. Uh, I'm on the bottom screen, H get all uh, look at person 46. There we go. Jack Becker is now in our vanilla Redis instance in beautiful verdant Kriegerboro, South Carolina. So uh, Riot is great because you could also, like I didn't actually add any extra um, options to my Riot Redis replication command but you could actually manipulate the data between both databases. You could actually convert it, the hash to a JSON or something like that if you wanted. Um, it's, it's really, really powerful. Um, and uh, in, in Discord, uh, this person had to actually do it quickly because the client was gonna be live and it sounds like it, they needed to, to switch the, uh, from Redis search to regular Redis and it actually got the job done. And I'll show you one more command that I really like. Uh, whoop, there we go, riot file. And so this will actually export uh, your uh, database to a JSON object, which can be great um, if you wanted to use it in any other instance. Um, of course, we have JSON, or we have uh, you know, regular dumps, uh, consistent uh, dumping of our, our, our database file um, and AOF file, uh, you know, just as a backup. But, uh, this will write everything to a JSON file. And then let's just look at this. And there we go. So now we have every single key, uh, every single object in our database is converted to a uh, very simple uh, JSON object. And it's kind of meta. So it says key, sets it to key, sets you, tells you if it had a TTL. So you can actually preserve the TTLs from time to live from one database to the other. Uh, what data type it was, and then the actual values contained uh, within that hash. So it's very useful. And you can also set it to XML if you, if you so chose. So um, yeah, I really like Riot DB. It's helped me a lot. Um, and it allows you to kind of like manipulate the data between uh, the, the databases if you so choose. So, and you can also just like import a JSON file. It doesn't have to be from you know, uh, originating JSON. You can just set this up as a format and then import it into uh, Redis, usually without a problem. So hopefully that answers the question uh, and hopefully everybody will be excited to try Riot uh, <laughs> when they have some downtime. Cool, thanks Justin. Yeah, I think that might be the first time we've mentioned Riot so far, so. Maybe. I mean, I, th I think I, I talk about it every once in a while, like, oh, you could always use Riot. Um, but yeah, I wanted to show everybody it actually being used. Um, it's, a, it's pretty easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it was really cool when, you know, when you have the different terminal windows up and you can demonstrate it that way as well. Uh, yeah. Just to prove it. So it's really <laughs> like, but you're demonstrating, yeah. you're like, you're definitely doing that whole don't try this at home people, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm a professional. I can melt down my own my laptop, and it'll be fine. Don't do this in production. <laughs> yeah. Segue to the previous question as well. If you're on a Mac and you've got the Homebrew package management, guess what? You can install Riot through Brew. So yeah, it's like a single command to get a hold of it as well. And we did post the uh, the GitHub there. So from there, there's documentation links and everything you need. 
I nice. will say I did the most horrible thing a developer could do. I updated my operating system uh, before <laughs> I uh, tried to demonstrate this. Um, and so yesterday I was uh, shaving a yak, if you will, for two hours trying to get everything set up back. Uh, the newest version of Ventura uh, did not update Xcode for me. So if you're using a Mac, um, it would not update. So I had to manually find um, a download for uh, Xcode and then do it by hand. But Xcode is gigantic. It's like 28 gigs. So downloading it, unpacking it, and then installing it, and then moving it uh, was, a, was a pain. I'm sure there's a better workaround, but I just knew that that was going to work. So uh, an extra little pro tip. Be careful about updating to the most recent OS. Yeah, and uh, make sure whatever you use with your machine, like say it was your personal machine, make sure none of it um, won't work with the new iOS. Yeah. Especially if you've got like drivers and stuff for printers and things like that. Sometimes it's not going to work. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that can be painful. But when you said like you, you did the worst thing that a developer could do, I was like, what, what is this, right? Are I guess you there's there? a lot of those. <laughs> Well, yeah, I was like, I thought you were seriously going to tell us you use spaces instead of tabs. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want to open that up. That's a whole new can of spam. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's let's not go into that because we might find some stuff about each other that we don't really want to know. You don't yeah. talk about politics, religion, and spaces versus tabs. That no, we don't. We don't. We don't. Yeah, yeah if you want to share in the chat what you use, you can. <laughs> We won't judge, but uh, we won't we judge. ban you, but we won't judge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, cool. Okay, so yeah, that's where you find out about Riot. Go to uh, developer.redis.com. No, not developer.redis.com. GitHub.com slash Redis developer. Same <laughs> thing, isn't it? Same yeah. thing. It's all Redis developer. So yeah, slash Riot. Please go there and find out. And if you want to chat about Riot with us in Discord, discord.gg slash Redis. Cool. Okay, let us proceed. Let's proceed. It's all going very well here, isn't it? Probably tempted fate now. So, yes, it was all going very well, and then somebody brought up the J word, Java. <laughs> we love a bit of Java, don't we? Um, so, somebody wants to know how to connect to Redis using just a password without a username and the Jedis client, which is a Java client. Simon Prickett knows a lot about Java, so I'll let him explain this one. Ish. Um, yeah, so while well, we've got this slide up, so what the heck's going on there with usernames and passwords? So prior to Redis 6, you could secure Redis by basically sort of not bothering and just making sure that it wasn't accessible. You know, the host and the port that it was connected to were not generally accessible to things you didn't want them accessible to, like the internet. Um, post, or you could set a password for the entire server. So there was like a, a single user, if you like, that could basically do everything if they had that password. Um, and since Redis 6, there's a concept called access control lists, which is something that you'll see in like other databases and operating systems. So you can now configure like named users. So we could have like Suze, Justin, and Simon, and we could all be allowed to operate different commands um, on potentially different parts of the key space and we would have to authenticate with a username and a password to do that. So you can then sort of lock things down a little bit more so that people get, you know, the, I think it's called the principle of least privilege. It's like basically take away everything that they don't need and give it to them as, as they prove that they need it. Um, we have a course for how to uh, deal with that. We'll throw the URL for that later, but it's um, IU330. It's called Red Security. Um, it's a yeah, you know, security is a dry topic. We can't really hide that. So it's quite a fun course. It has videos with Redis horror stories of, you know, here's how if you do it wrong, bad things may happen. And Jamie, who made that course, got into the spirit of it and dressed up and we have props and all sorts of things. So yeah, you, you can make security a little bit more interesting than it could otherwise be. Um, but even if you're using Redis 6 or now Redis 7, there is still this concept of connecting with just a password and having that single user. So I'm going to swap over here. And here's an example with the Jedis client of how you can do that. There's several ways that you can specify a Redis connection. So I've gone for Redis URL format because it's the, um, 
the sort of one that is a one liner. So what you can see is the code I've got here is basically getting an environment variable called Redis URL and it will default to Redis on localhost 6379 or it can use that value and then it just starts a Jedis client with that. So really in this in this model, the question would be, well, what happens if I don't have a username? Um, so the format of a URL is Redis colon slash slash username colon password at host colon port. And there's some other things that you can put in there, but you generally don't need them. Um, so if you don't know your username or you're connecting with that, well, if you are connecting with that site's so one user that's been configured um, and Redis has been configured to still accept that, then your username is default, or in some clients, you can just specify nothing there. So you can just do colon and then the password and then at the host and the port. Um, this isn't specific to Jedis or Java. It's, um, it's for all clients, really. It's just so happened that the question was about Jedis and Java. So if you were using Node, you'd use the um, Redis, node redis constructor that uses the url or if you're using the broken out object you put your know, username is default and password is whatever the password is and same for python and pretty much any other language so yeah that's that's it. basically if you just get given a password and nothing else then your redis is likely configured with that single user use uh, default cool thanks for that um you did mention the redis security course there Indeed. So I'm just going to show everybody where they can find that. I did put the link in the chat as well. So if you go to university.redis.com, you will be able to find all of our courses. And uh, Redis Security is code name RU330. Tell them Justin sent you. Okay. They let you in. <laughs> so, yeah, Redis Security is the course you want if you want to know about that. So all of our courses run in the six-week cohorts, which means that you can take up to six weeks to learn everything and complete the um, the required material to get your certificate at the end. And you can join at any point during those six weeks. So if you know if you are really quick, you could join the day before that cohort ends and do everything and still get your certificate. So we are currently about a week and a bit into the current cohort. So if four-ish weeks is um, enough for you, feel free to join any of our courses now. If you want the full six weeks, then just wait until the beginning of February to do that. So that was Redis Security. Let me just quickly show you the other ones. So we've got Redis for .NET developers coming soon. Our friend and colleague Steve is currently writing that one. So if you want to be among the first to take that course, come to university.redis.com, click the Learn More button, and you can put your info in here if you click the register button, you can get informed when that course is ready for you. So the courses that are currently ready for you to take, Introduction to Redis Data Structures, Redis for Java Developers, there's been a lot of talk about Java today on the show, Redis for JavaScript Developers, Python Developers, Redis Streams, everyone loves a stream, querying and indexing in full text search, storing, querying and indexing JSON at speed. That is also a, that's the newest one now um, until Steve comes along. Running Redis at scale and the Redis security one that we just mentioned. So there's something there for everybody. I took introduction to Redis data structures with Justin. I normally say last year, but of course it's not last year anymore <laughs> because it's now 2023. So when I first joined the company, August, 2021, um, a couple of months later, Justin and I did a set of live streams about that. So if you're not too sure, like, you you know, new year, new stuff you want to learn, you fancy dipping your toe into Redis, you're a bit scared of taking course, go on our YouTube channel and look for RU101 Live. There's a playlist on there. We did five weeks of that, start, starting, of course, at week zero. That was Justin's idea, a very good idea. Um, <laughs> And we went through the course material. And you can see exactly what it looks like without having to commit yourself if you're a little bit undecided and you want to see. Um, and you can even get some hints as to what the homework's like and, you know, the types of things that you ask and what the exam's like and all of that good stuff. So, yeah, have a look at that if you're not too sure. But if you are sure, you can join up now, get another four or so weeks on any of these courses. But if you want the full six weeks, then uh, you can start on the 9th of February 
if you're a .NET person, then put your email address in. We will not spam you. We will only use that email address to tell you when that course is ready for you. And I think we've got, is it like nearly 100 people so far, Simon, that are registered their interest in that one? Yeah, we've had quite a lot of people <laughs> ask about, can we have a .NET course? Um, I think the other thing that's interesting for people that may not be immediately obvious from here is if you take one of the existing programming courses, so like Python, Java, or uh, Node, and then you go to take another one, it's it's the same problem domain, and it's the same um, Redis. You, you learn the same things about Redis, just in a different language. This new one, the .NET course, is different. So it doesn't do the solar panels example. It does some other things um, because you know, it's been developed since the product moved forwards a bit. And also the, the concerns of a .NET developer are different from those of other languages. So it's very much tailored to .NET and it's not just a carbon copy of the other courses ported to a .NET backend. Yeah, Steve has put a lot of thought into this and it's something that he's been wanting to do for a very long time. So uh, yeah, he is currently <laughs> heads down working on this course. And yeah, like I said, if you wanna be the first to know when it goes live hit that register button and give us your email address we promise not to spam you we will only tell you what you want to know so yeah cool okay so last question then it is another java question so right okay this looks a bit complicated to me somebody is essentially they are asking about PubSub with jedis for java so uh simon yeah. please enlighten us so yeah don't tune out if you're not a java person because there's kind of like some as with a lot of things there's like general redis points here and the question happens to come at it from a java angle so this is another generic uh question that you could hit this this sort of problem and it would manifest differently in any programming language um basically what they're doing is they've got an application that is both a publisher and a subscriber for redis pops up and we'll look at what that means um, and I've got a problem with the, uh, it looks like the Redis connection that's doing the publish, that it's erroring out with that message. This is only allowed to do the following commands. Um, and you might think given the previous conversation, that might be a security thing. You know, maybe somebody set up this user so it can't do those things. Um, but it's not actually, it's more down to like how PubSub works. So what we're gonna do is, share the desktop here in a minute and before we do anything with uh, Java we'll just do some stuff with Redis and what I'm going to do is I'm not as good at Justin as being prepared for this he had his multiple tabs up and running but I am going to do something like this so what we're going to do is start Redis CLI on each of these so I've got like three connections to the same Redis and over here we're going to do just type subscribe messages and what you see is that connection is now like blocked it's waiting for something to happen and over here we're going to do subscribe messages as well so i've now got two things listening for anything on what's called a pub sub channel called messages and what this means is when I publish something, it's like broadcast television. So if I publish something, it'll go to both of the subscribers. And if the subscribers weren't in this mode of listening for it, they won't receive it because PubSub is what's called ephemeral. It's not stored in the database. If you want it stored in the database, you should use by the streams. But when I go away and do this, and let's make this a little bit so we can see things. And I do publish is hello what you'll see is that both of these and there could be many uh pops of clients receive the hello message and then if we get rid of this one temporarily and we do uh, publish messages well so that one on the right that we're still listening gets this but if i go back to here and do to subscribe uh, messages nothing so as we were saying it's ephemeral it doesn't exist in the key space so if i now do publish messages 
whatever they'll both get that one but you know it's the one that kind of took a break from listening that this message doesn't exist to it it's never going to receive that so we've got connections over here and these are blocked so they're like what's called blocking connections so they can't really do anything else whilst they are waiting for messages to come in and um what we can do is come out of these right now and bring this one back and look at some code. So if we have an application that uses PubSub, so this is a Java application that uses Jedis. It's just a simple single class thing. And I've got two threads going on here. So separate lines of execution. I've got a publisher that's going to handle putting things on the PubSub and I've got a subscriber that's going to handle receiving them. And what we've got here is I've got a connection to Redis, my local Redis. And in the publisher here, I'm just basically going to constantly sleep for three seconds, uh, create a new timestamp, and publish that new value out into the world. And then at the same time, I want to have a subscriber thread. So normally, there's to be some other process. Um, but it might also be something in your application, which is what's going on here. And that subscriber thread is going to do something similar. It's going to do subscribe. And the way Jedis works with that is we basically provide an on-message listener. So I've got an on-message listener here that's just going to dump out whatever it receives. And it is going to subscribe on pops up channel, which we've called Jedis Demo. So we can't see Jedis Demo in the database because it's ephemeral. There's no keys for it. But what will happen is when this publishes something every three seconds, any instances of this thread that are running should receive them. So let's go steal the, uh, the Maven command to run this and see what happens. So what happens is off we go. We compile it because Java. And oh, OK. So we basically got the error that the person in the question was having. So you can't execute publish. Uh, only the subscribe commands are allowed in this context. And that is because, let's go back to VS Code, because we're trying to reuse this one connection that we've got here. Oops, here. So when we do that, uh, as soon as it runs and it goes into this subscribe mode, then the connection, it's a Redis server thing. The connection to the server is no longer able to run other commands other than more subscribe. So you can subscribe to different patterns of channels or whatever, but you can't do other commands because they're like special blocking commands for subscribing because you have to wait for messages. So what we need to do is run the subscriber on its own client. Um, so what we're going to do is some copy paste lazy stuff here and just do Let's make a oops, subscriber client. And what we're going to do with that is down here, we're going to use it. Subscriber client. And then we're going to clean up down here. And basically do everything we're doing with the publisher client, we're going to do with the subscriber one. And it's like that. So what we're going to do now is run these both in separate threads, which is a Java thing, and in separate red, separate Redis clients, so separate connections to the database, so that when this one here goes into the subscribe mode, the other one's still able to operate. And if we get rid of that and do this, then hopefully something good happens. There we go. So now we've got one thread here is publishing things, and then the other one's picking it up. Um, and it's working. So we're not seeing that error anymore. And this is true of all languages. So if you're doing pop subs in the same uh, process, you need to use a second a second client because the first one is going to be blocked and limited to only the, uh, the subscriber commands. And then to prove that this is like a non-language specific mechanism, we can bring back some of our, wherever our other windows are. that one we can bring back this one and we can do reddit cli and i can do subscribe to whatever we called it get this demo and you'll see that this subscriber over here also receives these doesn't affect our code receiving them and everything is receiving them so you know pub sub is a 
database level thing and I can start another instance of this and do subscribe. Well, actually, let's do something else. So if I do, I can have multiple publishers as well. So if I do publish Jedis demo I, you see it got a message that it didn't create over here, but so did our other terminal instance it. Um, so yeah, that's the thing. Um, if you are doing these sorts of, of processes, the trick, and again, it's not a job trick, it's a all uh, Redis client trick, is use a second connection. So if you're working with Node.js, um, that actually has a thing to, if this was our first connection, Node.js, the client, has a duplicate method that just creates a new copy of it using the same host and port, and you could use that. Um, Jedis here has a connection pool thing that I didn't have time to, to mess around with, but you could probably use that too. But basically the, the crux of it is use separate connections if you're working in the same process with publish and subscribe. Nice. I did not think I was going to be seeing six different terminal windows on this show today. <laughs> <laughs> so that was definitely a bonus. Thank you for that. Um, I don't think we've covered that topic before on here, have we? I don't think so. No, not. I think no. we've done pop sub, but not like the sort of nuances of, of doing both. Yeah. And I think uh, there's probably a few people watching that are glad that you said don't you know, don't zone out because we're talking about Java because this equally can apply to your favorite programming language, even if it isn't Java. So um, yes, that much is good. I do want to acknowledge at this point, we did receive a question. And what I would like to say to anybody watching is that we generally, we don't tend to take new questions on this show because as you can probably appreciate, it's really hard to answer a question and that's just thrown at you from left field. Um, and also, we sometimes we are not the subject matter expert for the question that you are asking. So the question that was asked was about something that none of us are the expert in. Um, so if you do have a question while you're watching us live, and it's not super directly related to what we are talking about at that moment or on the show, the best place to go is Discord, because there you will find the people who really know and that actually have time to think about it. Because, um, yeah, if we have to think about the answer here and give you an answer, it, it, it might not be that easy for us to do. So just wait to acknowledge, we did receive a question, we did see it, um, but we cannot unfortunately answer that live on this show today. If you go to Discord, then uh, our colleague Brian will be able to help you out with that one. And yeah, if, indeed, if you want to chat with us in between shows, go to Discord as well and you will find us on there. So let us have a quick look at our website, Redis Live. So if you want to see us streaming this year, I think we're still thinking about uh, what we want to do streaming wise this year. I think some of us are still maybe sort of in December mode, maybe not, I don't know. So maybe some people, if anyone who's celebrating Christmas might still have their Christmas decorations up. Right. It just feels like so long ago now. So we're still thinking about what we want to do. And some people do a different thing every week. So like I know Simon's show takes quite a lot of prep because you've got the hardware and all of that good stuff. So you really have to think about it ahead of time. But if you want to know what we're going to be streaming um, in the future or what we streamed in the past, go to developer.redis.com slash redis live. And here on that page, you will find three tabs, upcoming events, recurring events, so these are our weekly shows, and past events. And if you look at the past events tab, all of these blue links on the right-hand side are links to the recordings on our YouTube channel. So if for some reason something unthinkable happened and you could not catch us live, that's fine. We may or may not have realized that at the time, so you might have gotten away with it, but regardless, you can go catch the recording, all will be well. We will never know the difference. So please do check out our YouTube channel and you'll find all the players on there. If you want an easy reference, say, for example, you missed Justin's last show, you can just come on here, right? Okay, he was last online then. Let's have a look at Dude Burr's Dream on JSON from the 12th of December. So that's where you can go look. 
I think that is about it. Did either of you want to talk about what you might be doing next on the streams? I know, Simon, you've got something coming up on Thursday yeah, next week. I, well, I was supposed to stream yesterday and didn't because I wasn't well enough. So next week, I think it currently says new project on there. It'll probably be easy way to start the year if there's anybody new to watching is um, take, I wanted to take a look through Redis stack as to how it can be used for IoT projects specifically. So probably counting things, keeping things in order, um, a little bit of pop sub and streams and so on for connecting things together. And then we'll pull some stuff off the shelf and figure out what we can we can build in subsequent weeks. So yeah, that, that's kind of me. Simon's show is a really good one to watch if you've got loads of like pocket money you want to spend on toys and uh, try out the code on the hardware and all of that good thing stuff. Oh, so I just looked in the chat. Michael is one of our Redis Insiders has commented. Wow, what am I seeing? The first dream in JSON. Yes, Michael, check out the recordings <laughs> and you'll be able to find out the first dream in JSON. Michael is so, uh, Mike, Michael always makes me laugh. He's always <laughs> so full of energy. So cool, such a cool guy. That will be uh, my stream. Uh, that will be recurring. So I have been consuming uh, a huge amount of data about bird watching, and um, I've compiled it and kind of manipulated the JSON in a way that um, it just makes sense for what we want to do with uh, Redis search or with search within Redis stack. So um, on Mondays, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, Pacific Time, um, I do my stream and um, I'll go over basically the structure that I have set up within Redis for the data. And now we're actually going to be going into um, displaying it on some kind of UI. So um, I'm going to be start working on that. So get to look forward to that. And yeah, all the videos should be up on YouTube if you want to watch me just kind of bash my head against this. I think it's like six and a half gigs of uh, bird sighting data. It's ridiculous ridiculous but it's fun because i like birds so it's funny isn't it it's like you know you sort of operate in your own little world and your <laughs> own hobbies and i know you are you you love birds and you love all sorts of nature and you know all animals and stuff but you kind of like sometimes don't realize that there are whole massive communities of people have this common interest and i think we were all amazed when you told us about the size of that data set yeah it's it's absolutely amazing and I've, I've gone through a lot of, there's like a lot of paragraphs and texts and like people are like hanging out in the weirdest of places for hours just to wait to see like a specific bird or they'll dutifully count birds at one location over and over and over like throughout the season. It's like, that's really cool. I, I don't know if I'm that much of a bird enthusiast. Like I have binoculars and I have a book so I can look out my window and identify them, but that's a, maybe when I retire because <laughs> that's a lot of work and it's really cool because people have such you know pa huge passions about you know their their hobbies yeah i wonder if you can actually not predict but like you can get some feel for when you might see one because otherwise you're just indiscriminately sitting there for hours and days and weeks yeah i mean i could take a lot of this the sighting dates and data and uh i could feed them into redis you know and we could start looking at time series charts, things like that, and seeing what, what actually comes up. Because, yeah, you know, you see Canadian geese fly through when they're uh, migrating south or north, or you see, you know, some of the smaller ground birds during the winter. So, yeah, I, I'm sure we could definitely see a trend. So the um, birders yeah. need redis. <laughs> that is really interesting, that what you just said about migration, because you walk around, you know, outside, and you notice whatever you notice. So like some people might be interested in flowers, some people might be interested in trees, some people are interested in cars. So you're all noticing different things, but everything is happening. It's yeah. just that you don't notice everything. So those birds would have migrated, you know, I'm quite old, but those birds would have migrated overhead so many times. I just never really thought about it. So that's really interesting to me. I was, uh, I was walking through a forest uh, last weekend with one of my friends and I was looking around for birds and my friend was looking around for mushrooms because they're uh, like a, a mushroom forager. So they were pointing out like chanterelles and turkey tails and things like that. I'm like, oh, that's a black crested chickadee or that's a brown creeper. 
it was really kind of funny because it was a knowledge share. And we were like, how do you know so, you know, so many things? And it's like, well, how do you know so many things? And yeah, it was really cool. Yeah, exactly. You like you learn by doing, definitely. And like I can just imagine one of you's like looking <laughs> low, the other one's looking up there. Exactly. It's, uh, it's yeah. a question of perspective, isn't it? Yeah, we just need a tree identifier. Yeah, so I'm kind of wondering as well, like obviously there was that very severe weather in the US and there was, um, you know, some very bad things that happened to some people because of the weather. But I wonder if, like you were saying, you know, people go out and bird watch. But I wonder if like, A, people were able to do that. Like, will you have seen a massive dip? But also B, did the birds actually hang around for that or did they go somewhere else? And like, what did they do when this weather came along that was kind of a little bit, you know, once in every 40 years. I think that they have better ways of predicting bird or predicting weather than than we do. You know, when it rains, the birds will like hide under trees and start squawking and tweeting. But like if it gets really bad, they're just gone. So mm. yeah, so it'd be interesting to see what the data says for the yeah. you know for that couple of weeks, I reckon. I'm also kind of wondering like whether we can add our two legged fox. <laughs> to the day because I mean, you get flying foxes oh yeah 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 that's true i do feel that's a bit of a stretch but you know i feel like we need to log this somewhere <laughs> but i think it only goes to one person's garden so it'll be you know it'll be a very interesting spread of data that said maybe it does go to everywhere we just don't know it's just one we only know because one person's videoed this fox and shared the video you never know yeah, you don't know what you don't know, do you? That's the mm. beauty of data. Well, the, the other thing that happened in England that may or may not have made the news internationally over the Christmas period was we had a walrus turn up in like Eastern Yorkshire, which is like Arctic walruses don't live there, which is probably a bad sign for the Arctic. But also the same walrus has been spotted in like France and Belgium and South. Oh, wow. It goes around. But the funny thing was it turned up and they put a cordon around it to stop people from like getting too close and disturbing it because it was resting and they cancelled the entire town's new year fireworks to not disturb the walrus and it left at 11 45 p.m on new year's eve <laughs> so it kind of was like i'm out of here so, don't schedule things around nature <laughs> no nope. never trust the walrus that is a pro tip never schedule things around nature that is <laughs> if you take that whole Never work with children and animals and take it up a level. Yeah, don't work with nature. Just don't do it. Don't do it. We've got a we've got a couple of people saying hello in the chat. Hello, folks. You've joined us at the very end of our show. We are just wrapping up. But if you want to catch the recording, it will be on YouTube um, very shortly. So go to our YouTube channel and check that out. Vidra's fellow fellow ex Redis Dev here. Hello, fellow ex Redis Dev. Good to see you. Nice. Thanks for dropping by. Have either of you got anything else you want to say before we sign off? Uh, I just have to say Happy New Year and uh, glad everybody's still with us and um, look forward to you know more fun content, more streams, more courses, just more good stuff. Yeah. Uh, don't mean to spoiler alert, but Justin maybe come to a stage near you as well. <laughs> Very true, very true. Yeah, yeah. I won't say any more. You'll just have to keep your ear to the ground and find out what I'm talking about in a couple of months' time. Cool. <laughs> okay, so I feel like we, we have not lost our pro touch. It is 6.59 here in the UK, and we finish at 7 o'clock. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye to you all. Look after yourselves. Stay safe. We'll see you again next week at the same time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.